Hello, we're glad to have you with us today again, and we're continuing a series on the good news message. The word gospel means good news. It's a good news message, and it's the greatest news that you will ever hear. There's no news that is even approximates the good news of the gospel, and we have been on this theme for a while now, and today we're, we're going to look at the greatest verse in the Bible. I believe it to be the greatest verse. I'm not the only one, by the way. I, um, I've i seen others, uh, ag again, when I looked on the internet, they call this the greatest verse in the Bible as well. But anyway, we want to talk about this today, and maybe for the next couple of weeks, we want to discuss this verse, the greatest verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. So we'll uh, publish it, God willing, here after our services, and then uh, you can listen to it over and over again if you like. But we've been preaching on the good news message, and, and the last one, I don't know that I ever published this one, by the way, but uh, so I'm not sure you can find that, but you, you can go back and look at the dates these are some of the sermons that we have preached on the good news message. We kind of began this theme back in June, and we called the first one uh, Boasting Aloud. Number two, because I'd been preaching through the book of Galatians, and it was from that point on that I began to preach on the good news message. But that also is a, is a um, great um, uh, teaching from the Apostle Paul on uh, what we can boast about, what we should be boasting about. So I hope that you'll uh, look at these sermons. I hope that you'll share these sermons with others and listen to them during the week because you'll pick up things about the good news message. And once you start listening to these and start picking up the theme, you'll find that it's on your heart and it'll be easier to, to talk to others about as well. So I encourage you to look at listen to these sermons. All right, so today uh, we want to we want to again consider this good news message and there, here's a broad outline we've put up a few times on this good news message. It's always about Jesus. That's what makes this good news. it's it's a good news message about a person. And the person is Jesus Christ. But there's some bad news that we have to tell people. And that is, and the gospel message tells us about man has sinned against God. And so as a result, God is loving. Yes, we're going to talk about that today, but he's also just and he must punish sin. There's something called the wrath of God. And even in this great verse that we want to talk about today, you're going to see that um we're going to read about the wrath of God. And uh, all of us have sinned. So all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And what makes it even worse is we can't save ourselves. And so people have to understand this right here, or it's not good news. Most people don't see themselves as being all that bad. But the Bible tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all, we all at one time or another face the wrath of God. But the good news is that Jesus Christ saves us by grace. It's a gift. We don't give him any reason to save us. It's grace. We don't merit it, deserve it in any way. And uh, it comes through faith. That's the only way that we, that's the instrument that God uses. And God is just, remember, he's, he's, he's loving. Well, he's also just, and he must punish sin over here. Well, he's also loving. We'll, we'll read that today. And he doesn't want to punish us. And, but he demands things because he's just. And he demands that um, we have to perfectly obey his law. But we haven't done that. And what he demands, he provides for us, doesn't he? And he does that by providing Jesus Christ. Jesus paid the penalty, and he gives us his perfect righteousness. And so we're saved. We're made right with God. That's what it means to justify. We receive credited righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's given to us. It's a gift. 
It's an undeserved gift when we put our faith in him to save us. So anyway, this is what we are um, uh, this is what we are discussing in this series on the good news message. So today we want to look at this verse, the greatest verse in the Bible. And uh, the entire Bible, I'm told, in, in um, I, I read somewhere that the entire Bible has been just uh, put in, in on one page, a printed page. Uh, can you imagine just uh, taking all the print and making it so tiny that it could fit on one piece of paper? I don't know if it's front and back or just the front, but somebody they say has done that. Now, I don't know the the purpose in that, because I suppose you'd need the uh, Hubble telescope to read uh, print that that's small. But anyway, it, when we come to John 3, 16, basically we have God's word in a miniature because it contains the entire good news message in a nutshell. Somebody's put the entire word of God in a nutshell, you might say, on one sheet of paper. Well, God has put in a nutshell, the entire message of his revelation in God's word in one verse, John 3, 16. And by the way, I'll say at the very beginning, I really encourage you to memorize this verse. It's not hard to do. Memorize it. Um, before you get out of bed in the morning, I usually go over some verses before I get out of bed in my mind that I've been trying to memorize and just go over it in your mind. Go over it during the day. It's it's a very easy verse to memorize, and it's worth memorizing. So why is this the greatest verse in the Bible? Well, it presents the greatest theme in the Bible, we said, the, the good news message about Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it tells us that God's love through Jesus Christ saves everyone who believes and saves them from what? Eternal wrath, and saves them to eternal life. Now, we've been preaching the last couple of Lord's Days on John chapter 3. We, we started a couple of Lord's Days back, I believe, talking about the new birth. You remember there was a man, a Jewish man, who came to Jesus at night, and he had some questions to ask Jesus. What had happened is, Jesus was um, in Jerusalem, and a lot of people were coming to believe in Jesus. Now, the the religious leaders, they were called Pharisees, and uh, many of them were part of the Sanhedrin. This was the ruling party. It'd be like the United States Senate and Congress. They were the ones who were the ruling party of the Jews in that day and time, and they weren't happy about the common people uh, claiming and believing Jesus to be the Messiah. They were putting their faith in Jesus and, of course, being saved. Well, Nicodemus was part of this ruling party, and and um, he was interested in this. He he had some questions, and so in, he came to Jesus at night, and probably because he didn't want to see anybody to see him coming to talk to Jesus and ask him some questions, uh, Jesus some questions. So he came to Jesus, and this was a private interview. You know, you would think this is the greatest verse in the Bible. God, you're giving us the greatest verse in the Bible. It must be during the greatest sermon Jesus ever preached. No, it was in a private interview. Nobody heard these words at this time uh, uh, initially except one man at night. Nobody else heard, heard this passage, John 3.16. And you remember Nicodemus had was confused over what it meant to be born again. And Jesus explained to him to be born again. This whole passage is about faith. It's what people had been doing in the previous chapter leading up to this interview with Jesus. And it's what he talks about in this passage. He he chided Nicodemus. He said, uh, You're a, you are the teacher, not just a teacher. You are the teacher of Israel. And you don't know these things? Well, what was he chiding, chiding him about? You're a teacher of the Old Testament. You know the Bible really, really well, you think. And you don't know what the new birth is? And Jesus was pointing to some teaching in the Old Testament. And 
as you can see in our sermons, we explained he's referring back to what uh, God said to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 36, verses 25 through 27. And, and uh, it is in reference to the being born, get, receiving this eternal life, life. That when you when you're born, you're given life. It's this eternal life that is received by faith. And so uh, Jesus, Jesus is pointing him uh, as he's teaching Nicodemus here to this passage in John 3, 16. Now in verse 15, Jesus says the same thing uh, in, in many of the same things in verse 15 as he does 16. He ends by saying, uh, everyone who believes uh, will receive eternal life. And Jesus is going to say the same thing here in verse 16, except add, will not perish, but have eternal life. Same words, but Jesus does add, he will not perish, but receive uh, eternal life uh, uh, in that part. But this is the greatest verse in the Bible. And uh, in this verse, we actually see the gospel spread out. Now, in English, the Bible's translated into many languages, some people have come up and, and shown that you actually have the word gospel uh, spelled out in this verse in John 3.16. And you'll see this verse on people's t-shirts. You'll see graffiti that has John 3.16. Uh, you'll see it under underpasses sometimes. And what people are hoping when they put this verse on t-shirts and different things they're hoping that if people will only see this verse and they'll pick up their Bible and read this one verse, that maybe they'll come to be believers and to be saved. This one verse that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the it, this verse presents uh, such an important message, and this cannot be known. This revelation, this is a revelation from God. You won't know this unless God were to reveal this to, to us. In other words, uh, God created the world. Some people think Genesis 1 or 1 verse 1, maybe, is the greatest verse in the Bible. But, you know, we can know that there's a creator without God revealing it through his special revelation, the Bible. The Bible teaches that. Uh, a lot of people say, well, the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God, those are, that's the greatest passage in the Bible. Well, I agree these are great passages, by the way, but you know, God has written the moral law upon our hearts. Everyone knows that it's wrong to murder and to commit adultery and to steal and to lie. You, and and I could go on through the Ten Commandments, but these are things that God has written on our hearts. And yes, they are made clear when the Ten Commandments, the moral law is taught. But John 3.16 cannot be known apart from a special revelation from God. You're not going to learn this about God's love and him sending his son, and whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You're not going to know that through nature. You're not going to know that through the Ten Commandments. This, this required special revelation, and it answers the greatest question, and it, an and it gives us the greatest answer to this uh, idea right here. Now, I, I've told you in the past that I I've come to know the grace of God in the last maybe 12 years of my life. I grew up in a, in a group, a religious group, that doesn't believe that we're saved by faith. Even though this verse teaches it, and there's many, many verses that teach it. And uh, I'll talk about that here in a few moments. And we'll talk about that maybe in the next couple of sermons. We'll highlight that, that whoever believes uh, will not perish, but have everlasting life. But one time I was sitting with some preachers in this group that I grew up in, in a restaurant, and they were sitting opposite to me in this, uh, on this, uh, in a booth. And anyway, one of them said, I'm sick and tired of these people who hold up this sign, John 3, 16 at sporting events. And I said, that's the greatest verse in the Bible. Now, 
later on, I'll tell you why exactly. They don't believe you're saved by faith. That's what bothers him about this verse. And uh, he doesn't want people to see that. And I don't know. I was trying to think, too, in my going back in my life. I'm not sure that I ever heard anybody in this religious group I grew up in ever preach on John 3.16. Now, I probably did sometime or another, but I don't ever remember it. Because this verse is going to emphasize things they don't want emphasize they don't emphasize, and uh, they you know they can preach on baptism saving you an entire sermon I had when I was in that uh, that group that denomination and 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 talk about baptism and nothing else the entire sermon how that it saves they you'll never hear them talking about faith saving an entire sermon on faith saving and nothing else uh, they would never leave out baptism even though the Bible says hundreds, thousands of times we're saved by faith, I suppose. I guess infinite number of times. But anyway, this is the greatest verse in the Bible. And um, as I said, it's the good news message about Jesus Christ in a nutshell. And it's so, in other words, it's a it's shorthand for the fact that God loves us and here's how he is saving us. Now, we can see uh, this great verse, as I said, at many sporting events. I went on the internet and, and uh, uh, took some pictures, got some pictures off the internet where people are at sporting events and they're holding up John 3.16. It, it might be behind, you know, uh, the dugout or something in a World Series game. It might be behind the backboard of an NBA championship game. It can be, you know, in the end zone where people are kicking field goals or whatever. When they see the ball going through the upright, uh, they'll see John 316. And you'll see this in uh, uh, these people going around and making sure people read this first. I'm told, um, in fact, I got a couple of pictures. I don't know if you remember this guy. He, he, he you, you don't have to know him, but his name is Tim Tebow. And he's a quarterback. He was a quarterback in college. They won a national championship in the game of football. And anyway, uh, this is what he wore on his face when he won the national championship. And also, I guess the uh, I, I think this is maybe the uh, Denver Denver uh, Broncos. And he was a professional quarterback as well. And he led them to this great victory. And again, he's he's wearing this um, John 3, 16 on his, on his face. And they said that after the national championship game, when he was wearing this John 3, 16, that there were 90 million searches on the internet to see what John 3, 16 said. Now you just think about it. Here's a man who got the gospel out to 90 million people just by wearing that in a big event like this. And I don't know how many I, uh, I I might have heard, but anyway, um, I they did say on on um, the Denver Broncos when he won that game, they said it was the most searched item on the internet, and so that's why people are putting it out there. This is the gospel in a nutshell. This is uh, this is the Lord's spirit moving in ways that we don't understand. You remember in this passage, in our last couple of sermons, we talked about uh, here when Jesus is teaching Nicodemus, the wind blows, and that's the Holy Spirit, and, and we don't know, you know, we can't see the wind, can we? But we see the effects of the wind, and we don't know how the Holy Spirit's going to move people. I know a lady who's a godly woman and she was raised in this denomination I was raised in. But when she turned 18, she became as immoral, maybe before that, as, as a, a woman can, can be. But she got pregnant. Her family's mad at her. She lost all her friends in college, you know, because she wasn't going to abort this baby. And uh, a friend of mine loaned her his pickup because she had no transportation. And she told me, she said, when I turned on the pickup, he had, you know, gospel music being played on a gospel radio station, and she became a believer, and she is a very godly woman, 
and she's led others to Christ, and she has a very godly family. But God moves. The Holy Spirit moves, like Jesus said in this passage. And I'm never going to criticize. In fact, I'm thrilled when politicians, when sports uh, athletes, anybody who is an influencer, when they tell people about Christ, and they're not ashamed of Christ, and when they wear John 3, 16, that's, that thrills me because it's the greatest verse in the Bible. I, a man, I read one time years ago that there was a man, he said that he had preached over 600 sermons on John 3, 16 alone. Now, if you added up that many Lord's Days, that would be 12 years. So I guess if he had vacations or sick leave or he, he uh, went on mission trips, preached elsewhere, it would have been, you know, 15 years, perhaps, he was preaching on John 3.16. And, and you wonder, how in the world could you get that many sermons out of John 3.16? Well, I, I, I probably couldn't ever do that, but, but I could preach uh, several sermons. I was thinking about him and thinking about how many sermons could be preaching, and I could preach a lot. Because first of all, you know, you, just this idea of God so loved the world, talking about the intensity of God's love. I'll talk about that a little bit. But you could talk about uh, the love of God, how that he's displayed it in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, man, how many sermons could you preach on the love of God and, and showing his love in all these different stories and, and uh, circumstances? Well, you could preach a lot just on the love of God, right? Or you could preach about the God himself, all of his attributes. Well, how long would it, well, you could preach for an eternity on all the attributes of God. Or what about Christ, all of his attributes, all of his work? Well, wow, how many sermons could you preach on Christ and his work? Um, you could preach on faith. There's the whole book of John. The whole purpose of the book of John is faith. What have we been reading about in this chapter? I mean, it's faith, faith, faith. The previous chapters already, this is John 3 in the previous chapters, we've just been bombarded with faith. John says, I wrote this whole gospel so that people would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and so that believing they could have eternal life. And, and we could, there's so many passages in God's Word where people exercise saving faith. Man, how many sermons could you preach on fat, faith? And then we will not perish. Well, people perish because of the wrath of God. How many sermons could you preach on the wrath of God and how that is, his wrath's been illustrated? Or uh, just taking the context. We we talked three sermons on the context so far. And, and but I think you could see that there could be numerous sermons preached on John 3.16 alone. You could use that as your basis. So I could see how that you could preach a lot of sermons on John 3.16. Now, I don't plan to preach 600 on it, but really every sermon I preach in the good news message is going to revolve around things taught in this passage. But I think you can see a lot of sermons could be preached with this sermon as your text. And I do plan to preach uh, maybe two or three sermons at least with this as my text. God loves you. And I, I want you to know that. And, and um, I want you to know, here's how much. And now the question is, what are you going to do about it? See, that's what this verse confronts you with. His love for you. Now, what are you going to do about this love that he has for you? You know, I, I've told you in the past, my uh, about 15 years ago, I think this really, God was using this to change my life. But in John, uh, in, in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul said something that I, I thought, man, I want to be like Paul. And this is what Paul said. Well, I, I want this to be true of me too. But Paul said, he said, uh, I don't count my life as anything, okay? Uh, the only aim that I have, he said, it, it is to finish the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to witnessing about the good news, the gospel of God's grace. And I thought, man, if that's Paul's only aim in life, that's my only aim in life. And so this is a great 
uh, passage, and we want to look at this. Now, I want to talk about this word great. I said it's the greatest verse in the Bible. You know, there are a lot of words that are overused, and this word great is a word that is overused as well. You'll hear people saying, well, we had great success. Sometimes a, a minister might go overseas, go on a mission trip, and they got to talk to a few people. They'll say it was a great, a great success. Well, it was, you know, we don't know how great it was. We don't know how God uh, is going to act. But, but, you know, as far as what we could see, maybe the person could see, maybe a couple of people, visitors came to church or a meeting or whatever. But we still use the word great. Or we'll say, man, I had a great time. I, I, man, that was a great, you know, whatever. And it might be okay, but, you know, I, I have a four-year-old grandson, and he he seems to overuse the word great. But, I mean, I'm okay with that because he really loves you or he, you know, whatever. I love him uh, using this term great. But we overuse the term great, don't we? And as a result, sometimes it's lost its force. But I'm going to tell you something. When we use the word great to describe the love of God, we're not overusing this term. I mean, it's being used in the true sense of the term great. Let me give you an, uh, some examples from God's word. In Ephesians chapter 2, God being rich in mercy because of his great love which with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By the way, when you're dead, you can't do anything for yourself. And we learn in this passage, it's by grace that we are saved, verse 8, through faith, and, and also uh, uh, in another passage here too. But anyway, we're saved by grace through faith, and um, and it's because of his great love. We were dead in our trespasses. We couldn't do anything. And God had to do something for us. It's because of his great love that we are saved. And um, also in chapter 3 of Ephesians, his love is expressed in terms of, of height and length and depth. As you will see, Paul's prayer, he says, was that uh, you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. By the way, if you want to pray something for others, pray that they might know the love of Christ. That's what we're going to talk about. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It's impossible to exhaust uh, the love of God. Now, you can exhaust the love of maybe a spouse or your friends or your parents, but it's not possible to exhaust the love of God. And one of the great songs that's written, and perhaps you know this, a lot of you will recognize this song written by Frederick Lehman, but it, he entitled it, The Love of God. And I think it's worth um, reading at this time. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. You, we, can, we can start talking about the love of God from this verse, and he's right. He says it goes beyond the highest star. Well, that's pretty high up there. And reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled. That's you and me, his erring child, those of us who are saved and pardon from his sin. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forever endure the saints and angels' song. When hoary time shall pass away, hoary meaning gray hair, um, when this uh, gray hair, our old age time, shall pass away, and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who here refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure still shall endure, all measureless and strong, redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels' song. And then I love this verse. Could we with ink the ocean fill, 
and were the skies of parchment made. Can you imagine having that much ink to write? You got the whole ocean. And then you got the whole sky as your, as your um, piece of paper. He said, were every stock on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade. All of us were writing. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. You can't write enough and, and exhaust writing about the love of God. So whenever the Bible says God's love is great, it means it. It's no exaggeration. It's no overuse of the word great. It's great in the true sense, the truest sense of that word. But also, his love is great because it's extravagant. Um, God so loved the world. Now, this is a really small word in English, and it's tied for the second, uh, the smallest word in this text uh, in English. But it, it's it's also a very intense word, even though it's small. It it's a lot of things are bound up in these two little letters, S and O. And what is tied up are things like the cross. He so loved the world. Well, we're talking about the cross, aren't we? We're talking about the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. We're talking about hope, assurance. We're talking about uh, our help. Uh, the Holy Spirit is our advocate. We could talk about a lot of things. You remember that passage where we talked, to, where we quoted uh, just now Ephesians uh, 3 verse 18, where Paul talks about the, the height and the depth and so on. Well, you could say this is the height of uh, what he is talking about. God uh, said in Psalm 103, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those, uh, for those who love him. So great is his love for those who uh, fear him. Um, and then there's this great verse that I need to preach on sometime. Romans 5 verse 8, God demonstrated his love. You know, a lot of people just talk say, I love you, and, and you really wonder if they ever really do. Well, God says it, but he backs it up. He demonstrated his love. Well, how in the world did you demonstrate your love for us? Well, in this, Paul says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'll tell you what, he goes on to say, sometimes you'll read about, I guess, you know, it's not infrequent. People will die for good people. People will die for their country because they believe in it. They're dying for what they believe is a true cause. And their people will die for their family and their friends at times. They will risk their lives. And, and police officers and people like that, they're, they're dying for what uh, they believe in. They're putting their lives on the line for us. Well, let me tell you something. People won't do that for evil people. You'll, you'll never read of anybody giving their life up for someone who is evil and wicked. And guess what? God loved us so much that he demonstrated it by giving us his very best, his son, when we were powerless, when we were, let in other passages, we were powerless. We couldn't do anything for ourselves in this context. And, and we, were, we were enemies of God. We were wicked. We were sinners. All of this in this passage, by the way, teaching of Paul and Romans. And so the world says, I love you if, you see, I love you if you, you look good. Or I love you if you're popular. I love you if you have a good education. I love you if you have drugs. I love you if you, if you uh, have a, a good body that I desire. I love you if you have money. I love you if you have a good job, if you have good connections, uh, if you produce more. I love you if you sell a lot. Uh, there's an endless amount of ifs. I love you if. The world rarely knows this kind of extravagant love that loves, that where it not only says I love you, it's not empty. It demonstrates the love. 
That's the love of God. And then we see in this verse also that God loved the world. So, uh, you know, we talked about the, uh, the, uh, the extravagance of God's love. Now, when we talk about the extent of God's love, we're talking about, you might say, the, the width of God's love. I was reading this morning a passage really thinking about this from 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, where, where uh, John, who also uh, records this gospel of John, but in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, he says, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. This whole world system rejects God, rejects this idea of uh, uh, of, of uh, John 3.16. There, there was a great story that I read about years ago, and, and I wrote it down to remember it to use in sermons. But Ernest Hemingway was, as you know, a great author in, uh, in English. And the reason I sometimes qualify things like that is because there's people who listen to my sermons in other countries, and they don't know who Ernest Hemingway is. And and uh, they don't know, maybe even English isn't their first language. But anyway, Ernest Hemingway was a great author in America. And he wrote one time about a father who decided to, to reconcile with his son. And so he put an ad in the El uh, Liberal in Spain, and it said this, Paco, Meet me at Hotel Montana, noon Tuesday, all is forgiven, Papa. And Paco is a common name in Spain, maybe the most common name. Anyway, when his father, when the father who put this ad in the paper went to this particular square to meet his son, 800, he says, Pacos uh, were waiting for their fathers. Well, this is God's ad, his address that he puts in his word saying, I love you. And um, we have a deep yearning for this kind of love that God has and has demonstrated for us. We all yearn for this kind of love. C.S. Lewis uh, said that our souls have a deep longing for a scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have not yet visited. How eloquently put. The world is yearning for this love that we are right, that uh, Jesus tells us about in John 3, verse 16. But not only does he speak of the height and the width of God's love in this passage, but he gave. Uh, Jesus, God gave his son. This speaks, you might say, of the depth of his love. He gave his one and only, his unique son. There, in other words, when we say one and only, there was no equal to Jesus Christ. There's never been anyone else like him. This is just another great demonstration, isn't it, of this passage here in Romans 5 verse 8 of the um, love of God. You remember the value. It, in Luke 15, Jesus tells these parables. And uh, the first parable is about a man who had a lost sheep. And then the second parable in that chapter is about a woman who had a lost coin. And the third uh, parable is about a man who had a lost, well, two lost sons, but Anyway, he had this one lost son that uh, that is really the, uh, well, I won't say that. Both of them were lost. He had lost boys. And um, anyway, you see the value that each one of the, the farmer put in that lost sheep. He, he had, this sheep was very valuable to him. This coin was very valuable to this woman who lost one of these 10 coins. And these two boys were valuable to the father. And um, I, and so this, this talks about the value. This speaks to the value of 
God giving us his son, doesn't it? So again, I went on the internet and I I just typed in I I I what's the most what's your most valuable possession? And so here are some of the things I got right off the internet. This is what people have put on there. It's up there, lots of people. Uh health for sure. That's what I value most of all. That's what I guess one person at least said. My kids. Most valuable thing. Uh, my kids' baby teeth. That was that was what one person put up there. Most valuable possession. My family, my neighbor, my boyfriend. And here's what one person wrote. My cat, as it has the most value to me emotionally, he was actually given to me and was not cheap either. I'm just writing, telling you what people wrote. Uh, my laptop is my most valuable possession. My health, my happiness, my memories, my wallet, my mind, my house. One person wrote a firearm in any shape or form. Another person wrote my 2003 Hyundai, uh, Hyundai Ascent, my grandfather's uh, badge from World War II. Another person wrote it's valuable in money and emotionally. Those are what people wrote. What's your most valuable possession? Well, I want to tell you something. God gave his most valuable possession. It was his one and only son. I read a story. I, I hope the story isn't true, but I read the story about this man who controlled a train track that went over a bridge and he had to change uh, the track, you know, for trains to go over the bridge and not run into each other, I guess, trains going both ways. And um, one time, his own son was playing up there on the bridge, and a train was coming. And if he didn't change the track, that train would go off into the river, and, and all the people would perish. But if he did change the track and allow that train to go straight ahead, his son was going to die. And he changed the track and all those people lived. And a lot of them didn't probably even know that, you know, a little boy was killed so that we could live. A man's own son died so that uh, we could live. And a lot of people don't understand Jesus has died for them and they don't even get it. He's died so that we might live. This is... Um, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. There is no greater gift. He gave his son. And then the length, you could say, of his love. You know, I'm very glad that Jesus didn't say there, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that if Jimmy Cutter believes in him, he will not perish but have everlasting life. I'm so glad he didn't say it that way. Because I would always wonder if there was another Jimmy Cutter out there that he was talking about. But I'm going to tell you something. When he said whosoever, that includes Jimmy Cutter. And that includes whosoever includes you if you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Karl Barth, if you go and look, he's a he's a renowned theologian. Died only about 50 years ago, but he was, you know, a really well-known, worldwide known theologian among all these religious institutions and scholars and so forth, quoted frequently. And here's this man who's brilliant and studied the Bible so much and has so much Bible knowledge. And someone asked him one time, they said, what's the most profound thought in all the Bible? And you know what his answer was? Jesus loves me, this I know. And he's right. Well, I'll tell you what, he got that right. Old man Klein was uh, mean. Old man Klein hated most everybody and everything, and he was hated by most everybody and 
uh, that you that ever knew him. He never went to church, but one Lord's Day, he was walking down a street, and the windows and and the uh, door to the church building were open, and they were singing this song right here. It's called Grace Tis a Charming Sound, written by Philip Doddridge. Twas grace that wrote my name in life's eternal book. He's listening to this church. They, he, he can hear this singing. Twas grace that gave to me the lamb who all my sorrow took. Saved by grace alone, this is all my plea. Jesus died for all mankind and Jesus died for me. Another verse, grace first contrived a way to save rebellious man and all the steps that grace display, which drew the wondrous plan. And then the refrain, saved by grace alone, this is all my plea. Jesus died for all mankind and Jesus died for me. And so he's hearing this as he's walking down the street, this song, these, this church building had, uh, has the windows open, this church congregation does, and the back doors open, and he's hearing these words distinctly. But he thinks they said in the chorus, saved by grace alone, this is all my plea. Uh, old man Klein said, thought they were saying, Jesus died for old man Klein, and Jesus died for me. He thought they were saying, Jesus died for old man Klein. And he became a believer. So the story goes. Well, I'll tell you something. You can put your name in there. Okay? Saved by grace alone. This is all my plea. Jesus died for, put your name there. And Jesus died for me. That's you. It can be you. Now, I'm going to preach, God willing, another at least couple of sermons probably on this passage. But before I do, I want to talk about this. Uh, I want to talk about faith. You're saved by faith. He says, all who believe will not perish, but have everlasting life. I just want to emphasize to you, this whole book of John talks about faith so much. You can't turn, you can't swing a cat around without here hitting the word faith about 10 times. It's all about faith from the beginning of this book, all the way through this whole chapter is about faith being saved by faith. And I just want you to know the Bible often teaches that we're saved by faith, that we are sanctified. That means we're purified by faith. We receive righteousness from God by faith. We receive forgiveness of sins by faith. We are appointed to eternal life by faith. We are children of God by faith. We're redeemed by faith. We receive the promise of the Holy Spirit by faith. And by the way, um, if you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you do not belong. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, Paul says, Romans 10, uh, 8, verse 9, you're not a Christian. You don't belong to Christ. And we receive the Holy Spirit when we believe it's never said of anything else. Um, our hearts are purified by faith. We receive the inheritance by faith. We are baptized through our faith in the power of God. It's not baptism that saves us. It's our faith that saves us. We're showing our, demonstrating our faith in the power of God to save us through Jesus. That's what we're doing, demonstrating our faith, that he died. He was buried. He was raised. We're showing to God, letting someone do that to us. It's not us. It's what he did for us in the death, the burial, resurrection, which our baptism signifies. It's ridiculous to think that our doing that is what saves us. No, it's what Christ did that saves us. And it's by faith uh, that we uh, are baptized. And our faith is in the power of God to save us, not what we do. We don't perish, but we have everlasting life by faith. We're justified. That means we're made right with God. We were estranged. That's what the word justified means. We're, we have a right standing with God. We know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ that we may be justified by faith. Three times in that passage, we're justified by faith. One verse. 
We're made righteous by faith. We're credited with righteousness by faith. We receive a sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for our sins by faith. We're at peace with God by faith. We have rivers of living water will flow from within. Anybody who believes has faith. We will not die in our sins if we believe. We're made children of Abraham by faith. We're blessed like Abraham by faith. We're not condemned by faith. We live by faith. We escape the darkness by faith. We, we have life through believing in his name. That's eternal life. We see the glory of God by faith. We become children of light by faith. We receive the promise by faith. We receive the light by faith. We have access into God's grace by faith. You'll never be saved without grace, and you won't get grace except through faith. That's how we gain access. John, Romans 5, 1 and 2, it's by faith. And then saved people are called believers. I grew up in a group that when they talked about their group in another city, they called them members of the church. The members of the church in California or the members of the church in Kansas, you'll never read that, that uh, phraseology in the Bible. Never. It's weird to anybody, by the way, that's uh, outside that group. Nobody else talks that way. We're called believers. I'll tell you what God calls saved people. He calls them believers. And you know why that group doesn't call people believers? Is they don't think you're saved by faith. They think you're saved when you're baptized. So they call them members of the church. Well, they, they ought to call them, you know, they claim, I grew up in a group that says, speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent and call Bible things by Bible names. Well, if you want to call Bible things, save people by Bible names, you're going to call save people believers. Because when you start reading in Acts and the New Testament letters to people and churches, God is one who wrote those words. And God calls those people over and over again, more than any other term, by far, he calls them believers. And you won't hear people call saved people believers who think they're saved by works. You just don't hear it. And we live by faith. Even after we become believers, we still live by faith. We please God by faith. We overcome the world by faith. We remain true to the faith. It is by faith from first to last. It's the goal of our faith is the salvation of our souls. We're never to renounce our faith in Christ. Anything that is not of faith is sin. And we read all these things, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. This is later in this chapter, John 3, 16 is found in. Whoever believes, again, um, in chapter one, uh, all who did receive him, who are the ones who received him? Who believed in his name? He gave the right to become children of God. You know how you become a child of God? You're adopted. Is to receive him. Well, how do you receive him? Believe in his name. Everyone who lives and believes in me. Look at John here, man. John is just saying this over. Jesus is over and over in John. This is the will of my father and everyone who looks on the son and believes in him. That's just what he said like two verses before our verse in John 3 verse uh, four, uh, John chapter 3 verse 14. Our verse is verse 16, but two verses earlier, he talks about the serpent in the, in the wilderness and how that he was lifted up. And anyone who looked to the serpent, you know, was saved from death, from being bitten by a poisonous snake. And, then, and he uses that two verses in a row that says, whoever believes in the son, you see, we look to the son, as he says here, um, whoever uh, believes in him, whoever looks on the son and believes in him. Whoever believes in him, uh, he because he has not believed in his name, they're condemned already. Uh, we believe in him by faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians uh, 2.16, as I said, this one passage, three times in one verse. I live by faith. That's how I live. I live by faith in the Son of God. Uh, you are all children of God. How, Paul? By faith. I'll tell you what. You, you have to absolutely let, be brainwashed like I was earlier in life and just ignore the fact that these verses are just ubiquitous. There's 
several on every page, sometimes several in one verse. Whole chapters, whole books are written about how we're saved by faith. In the Old Testament, we have example after example from Abraham, all of these great examples, people saved by faith. I want to tell you something. This is the greatest verse in the Bible for people who believe. But if you don't believe, you cannot be saved. You will perish. Because the bad news, remember the bad news? You're under the wrath of God before you believe and are saved. And you can believe in what God has done for you. And you can receive this good news, this grace. It's by grace alone. You're not earning it. You can't do so. If you're doing these things and that saves you, then you're earning it, right? You can't do that. Bible teaches that over and over. Someday I need to give a whole lesson just on that, showing you can't earn it. This is what Paul is wanting to say. You could boast about it if you could earn it. If you even uh, did a little bit, it's because what I do for a little bit, well, then you could boast about that little bit that you did. But guess what? It's grace alone. And that, that comes through faith. And so anyway, God willing, we'll continue to study this passage, but this is the greatest verse in the Bible. And really what we've just kind of, I mean, we haven't even touched upon it. It's like trying to count the grains of sand in the sea. We've taken one of those grains and looked a little bit at the love of God in this passage. What a great passage. So anyway, I hope that you will uh, listen to this over and over again, like we say. And I also hope that you will um, come to believe and uh, enjoy uh, the love of God. May God bless you.